What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Daniel Hallen and I am back for another true crime video. And today we're actually taking a bit of a break from my educational series to speak about the disappearance of 16 year old Carly Lane Gousset who vanished from her home in Chalfont Valley, California, right near Bishop on October 13th, 2018. At this point, majority of us are well aware of this case. You've probably at least seen Carly's picture circulating through social media. It was one of those cases that went absolutely viral and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that her stepmother was posting a lot of live videos about her disappearance on social media when it was happening. As you guys know, I typically wait a little bit if there is a viral case. Everyone is already covering it. I personally don't like to cover things right off the bat like that just because the situations are very fluid. There's a lot of changing details happening over the next couple of months to potentially the next couple of years. So I like to let everyone else kind of get that initial coverage and then I kind of come in on the back end and do a reminder slash update type of video. And that is what I'm finally doing today. This has been a very highly suggested case, probably because it is an insane roller coaster. It has caused a lot of uproar on social media. Unfortunately, there are numerous Facebook groups that are involved that are going at each other's throats. Um, people have really been taking advantage of the situation. Unfortunately, there's even individuals out there where it's been speculated they could possibly be Carly, um, different influencers, I guess you could say, or just people on social media. And and unfortunately, despite not being Carly, they let people continue to believe that, which is a really nasty situation. Um, there's just been a lot that has been going on, a lot of finger pointing, speculation, um, and I'm honestly heartbroken for everything that her loved ones have had to go through over the past couple of years. Seeing a loved one is already difficult, but when you pile all of this other stuff on top of it, it's just not an easy situation. Now, unfortunately, also because of all that, I feel like Carly has kind of been left on the back burner, so hopefully continuing to speak about Carly's disappearance and pushing for answers will bring forward tips and maybe get some movement in the case. So Carly Gousset was born on May 13th, 2002 to Zach Gousset and Lindsay Fairley. And when she was just a toddler, from what I've seen, it was right about at the age of two, her parents decided to separate and Carly went to live with her mother majority of the time. Within two or so years of the divorce and separation from Lindsay, Zach ended up marrying a woman named Melissa, who is Carly's stepmother, and they went on to have a family of their own. And I've seen timelines with this all over the place, which is kind of a theme in this entire case. According to most sources, around the time Carly was about five or six years old, she ended up moving in full time with her father instead. And Z had decided to move to Nevada and they didn't want to uproot Carly in her entire life. She was already in school. She was already building a life in Bishop, California. So the agreement was made that Carly would stay with her father and Melissa, along with a few of her siblings. Just months prior to Carly's disappearance, the Gousset family did decide to move out of Bishop, California to Chalfont Valley, California. It's a pretty isolated neighborhood of White Mountain Estates, which I will show you guys in Google Maps. It's nestled right between Chalfont and Bishop, and it's right along Highway six, essentially surrounded by nothing but desert. But according to Melissa, Carly's stepmother, she wasn't bothered by this at all. It's not like they entirely uprooted her from her life. She was very close to everyone that she knew where she grew up. It was like a 20 minute drive or so. She was still able to go to the same high school, still able to see her friends. So it wasn't anything that had impacted her negatively. Time of her disappearance, Carly was attending Bishop Union High School where she seemed to have a good group of friends. She was dating a guy named Don. She was just living the average teenage life. She was described by her friends as someone that was introverted, but the second you got her out of her shell, she was so much fun to be around. Her mother, Lindsay, describes her as being incredibly caring, incredibly nurturing, oftentimes putting everyone else's feelings before her own. She just wants to make sure that everyone around her is happy and well taken care of. She's a great big sister. She loved animals. Just overall, she was a well-rounded, good kid. As kids typically do, just Prior to her disappearance, she had run into a little bit of trouble. So according to Melissa, her stepmother, she had been caught smoking at school, smoking the marijuana. And this landed her in 
quite a bit of trouble. I don't know the exact details. I believe she was suspended for a period of time. Um, Melissa's also stated that she had to uh, have counseling within the school because of this. And at the same time, I've also seen sources state that her grades had started to slip. So there was something clearly going on here. I don't know if it was just her deciding to experiment with drugs. And so her head was kind of off on doing other fun things and not necessarily focused on school. Maybe she just wanted to be with her boyfriend. I feel like I had that period in high school. Most people do. Um, or maybe there was something else going on that no one is aware of. But regardless of all of that, that's what had been happening just prior to her disappearance. Now, I will state that Lindsay, her mother, has come forward and said that she was not personally aware of that any of this was really happening. Um, I don't know if she was told by Melissa after the fact or when exactly it was, but she stated that Melissa did tell her that eventually that there was some counseling that was going on, uh, but she didn't seem to have a lot of knowledge into what exactly was happening and felt that if there was something serious going on with Carly, because they had such a great relationship, Carly would have come to her to talk to her about it. And by all accounts, Carly was acting her typical happy self the entire beginning of October. And then all of a sudden, Carly vanished. So according to the current police timeline, which is important to state because you will find times all over the place when you go and look online about this, um, but the accepted version of events as of now um, is on the morning of October 13th, 2018, Melissa woke up around 7.15 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. to find Carly missing. And ultimately, Carly was reported as missing to the Mono County Sheriff's Department around 9.30 a.m. and then searches began. Now, when police arrived to the home, there didn't seem to be any sign of forced entry. Um, Carly had left behind all of her personal items, her cell phone, her glasses, her money, this was very out of character for Carly because she usually had her cell phone attached to her at all times. When police looked into her cell phone, they didn't find anything at all that gave them any hints as to where she could have gone. It just seemed like she got up in the morning, walked out, and somehow made it far enough away to where no one could find her. Now, apparently, Zach and Melissa, when they noticed that she was missing around 7.15 to 7.30, went out in their cars to search the nearby area, which, keep in mind, again, was a lot of desert. And they were unable to find any sign of her. Uh, local authorities brought in all of their own resources to hopefully try to locate Carly, who was very possibly missing in the middle of the desert. They brought out helicopters. Some of the helicopters had infrared. They brought out searchers on horseback, all terrain vehicles, dogs trying to track her scent. And these searches continued for about a week. Not much information was really being released at this time about the details of Carly's disappearance, such as, you know, what had happened during the disappearance, what had happened prior. But her story hit the news right off the bat anyways and circulated all over social media after Melissa Melissa began to reach out through a string of Facebook lives in hopes of spreading Carly's story so that this would maybe bring forward tips. And this is where the details get a little bit wonky and there are changes to the timeline and bits of details that caused a bit of confusion in the beginning and now has caused a crap ton of speculation. So after Carly went missing, as I stated, Melissa immediately hit the ground running with trying to raise awareness. I think it was within 10 hours of Carly's disappearance that Melissa posted her very first Facebook live. So hold on, Liza. Thank you. 
Now, I'm sure you already are seeing where a little bit of the timeline is off here, which I will get deeper into in a little bit. Live streams continued on from this point, just kind of speaking about what exactly was going on in the moment, showing the searching that was being done by the Mono County Sheriff's Department. The FBI was also participating in the searches and the investigation. And nine days into the disappearance, when police had canceled their search, they were unable to find anything. Melissa put up another video where she basically was like, the police are out of stand still. So I'm going to give you information that they have now allowed me to release. And this gave everyone for pretty much the first time a glimpse into the state of mind that Carly may have been in when she went missing and the events that led to her disappearance. According to what Melissa stated in this video and in following live streams and interviews, Carly had gone out the night of Friday, October the 12th, uh, to a football game in Bishop. I think it was just the typical high school football game. And she was supposed to go with her boyfriend, Donald, and a handful of friends. Sometime around 8 p.m., Melissa stated that she decided to reach out to Carly just to make sure that she wasn't going to need a ride home from the game. And Carly assured her that Donald, her boyfriend, was gonna bring her back home afterwards. And it doesn't seem to me that at this point in time, Melissa noticed anything odd at all during this phone call with Carly, or at least she's never come forward saying she did. But that completely changed 30 minutes later when Carly called Melissa back. So around 8.30, Carly called Melissa and at this point was very distressed. I've seen a few different versions of what exactly was said in this phone call. Melissa has claimed that Carly was like, look, never mind. I do need a ride. I need you to come and get me right away. I'm at the Highlands RV park. And she was scared of something. She was very, very upset. While other versions of this claim that Carly specifically told Melissa that she was booking it, like running in the dark down Dixon Lane, which is about one to two miles north of the RV park. Now, while I can't say for sure which is which, I kind of have a little bit of an idea of the one that makes the most sense. Um, Melissa said that the first place she went to was the RV park. And when she got there, she realized that Carly wasn't there. I don't know if there was a certain place Carly said she was going to meet her or if maybe Carly's friends or someone was there to say, hey, she's not here anymore. But regardless, once she realized Carly was no longer at this location, she decided to head off and search for Carly and eventually made her way to Dixon 
Lane. Now, I feel like if Carly had called her and said, I'm booking it down Dixon Lane, that probably would have been the first location that Melissa would have gone. So maybe that kind of explains the different stories there. But either way, this is where Melissa claims she ultimately found Carly. Dixon Lane is on the very outskirts of Bishop, surrounded again by desert. Uh, so the only way that Melissa was able to find that Carly was on this road was because she saw this little light bobbing up and down. And the closer she got, she realized that this was Carly running, looking absolutely terrified. And she had her phone in her hand with a flashlight on because it's pitch black in this area. I've Google walked it. Doesn't look like there's many lights out there. We're talking about nighttime in the desert. It was probably pitch black, but she was frantically running with this phone flashlight on. Melissa said it was very clear from the get-go that Carly was in a lot of distress. She said that Carly jumped into the back of the car, pale as a ghost. And from there, they drove back to their home where Melissa states they arrived at about 9 p.m., which it is about a 20 minute drive. So all of that seems to add up. Now, Zach, her father, home at the time, um, I believe he had gotten home from work that Friday at about 6.30 p.m. And according to him, he immediately got home and began to drink some beers. So his accounts of that night really aren't very detailed. Uh, and most information seems to be coming from Melissa. Melissa said that at some point during this drive or possibly once they had gotten home, I have not really been able to clarify that, that Carly ended up admitting to her that she never ever went to the football game, that in reality, she went to hang out with friends and Donald and they decided to smoke some weed. At this point, Melissa claims that she just thought that Carly was having some weird reaction to smoking marijuana and she didn't feel that it was necessary to take Carly to the hospital. Hospital. She believed she could just take Carly home to where she was safe and taken care of, and Carly would eventually come down and be totally. I was fine. really scared to put this out there because so many people are judgmental, and I don't want her story to die. And I was so scared just to say anything. And the investigators are like, "You can't talk to anybody about this because the FBI was involved, and if anybody finds out or they get spooked or somebody tips somebody off, then." She could be right here and then she could be gone. So this is hard right now because I just, I don't want people to judge her. Kids smoke pot all the time. And so around 5.40, 48 was my last text in the morning. Um, and uh, I fell back asleep and then that's when I woke up and she was gone. However, that is not at all what happened. Carly was very paranoid and scared for her life the entire night, up until the moment that she went missing and probably well after that. So during this drive home, I guess, Melissa stated that Carly was not just disoriented, but paranoid up until the point where they were given the go ahead by police to give details. They just described Carly as being disoriented prior to going missing, but she said paranoid and scared was a better kind of description. Um, and that Carly was jumping from seat to seat in the car the entire drive home very scared that the car was somehow going to kill her. So she got home, this behavior just continued. Zach has stated in interviews that one minute Carly would be huddled in a corner, scared that Melissa or Zach were going to kill her. Um, and then the next minute she would be saying how much she loved them. She would be thanking them for getting her, you know, saying she was happy that she was home. Um, she would want Melissa to paint her toenails or uh, color with her. Melissa said that to try to help Carly feel a little bit better, Better. She wanted to get some food into her system. So she tried to offer her like a power or a protein bar and also a salad. But Carly completely denied both of these things, even saying that the salad was the devil's lettuce. Um, and in terms of religion, she seemed to be speaking a lot about religion as well, which could again have some insight into her mental state. Um, she was specifically asking to go to church and read the Bible. She wanted Melissa to pray with her, saying this lettuce is the devil's lettuce, which I personally find interesting because that's also a slang term for marijuana, the devil's lettuce. Um, anyway, so that was kind of how most of the night was going. When Carly was refusing to eat and seemed to just not be getting over the state of paranoia, they also decided the best option would probably be to try to get Carly to get some sleep, sleep this off and feel better. Um, so she tried to put Carly to bed and Carly apparently asked Melissa to stay the night with her because she was so scared. She wanted Melissa to sleep in the bed with her. And in between these moments of 
of being absolutely horrified of Melissa and Zach. Carly, apparently, when she wasn't in those moments, would not let either of them out of her sight. She felt scared to be alone. Even when Melissa was, I guess, brushing her teeth and getting ready to lay down with her, Carly was right at her side. So according to Melissa, they went to try to wind down. Carly was writing something down for a period of time, watched a movie. They basically just hung out for a little while. And around, I believe, like 3 a.m. or so, they both went to sleep. Melissa has described that she was kind of in and out of sleep the whole night. I don't know if she ever saw Carly fall asleep for sure or anything. She has stated that at around 5.45 a.m., that was one of the times where she drifted out of sleep and she remembered looking over and Carly was laying there wide awake with her eyes wide open. Now she has stated in most of you know, her interviews and statements that the last time she spoke to Carly was at 5.45. So I don't know um, it, what she said to Carly at this point since she indicated she spoke to her. I don't know if Carly's demeanor had changed at this point, if she was still seeming paranoid. I have not seen that stated anywhere. Um, but that was the last time that Melissa says that she personally saw Carly and then she drifted back to sleep. And when she woke up, Carly was gone. Carly literally just vanished into thin air after a night filled with paranoia and fear. So this is the story that people are really hearing for the first time about how Carly disappeared. And again, the things that led up to her disappearance. And over the course of the next few live streams and interviews and things like that, more details continue to come out. Now, I quickly want to speak about something that was very heavily focused on, and it's still very heavily focused on when you go and look this up right now. So I believe it was possibly even the day after Carly's disappearance. Um, I at least know that it was within that October. Melissa did an interview on Dateline about the disappearance. It's been reported on numerous sources um, that in this interview, Melissa entirely changes her story. Now, I do want to state real quick that I have searched top to bottom, like Dateline archives, everything I possibly can to find this interview, to try to get a better understanding and confirm this information, but I cannot find it anywhere. Dr. Phil ended up speaking to both Melissa and Zach, as well as Lindsay, and he questioned Melissa about this. Allegedly in this interview with Dateline, Melissa said that she woke up at around 5.45 a.m. that morning. Um, so this is something that she had already stated, but instead of saying that she woke up in Carly's bed and was looking at Carly, who was wide awake with her eyes wide open. She stated that she had woken up that morning to do her typical rounds in the house to open up her kids doors and say good morning to them and get them ready for school. Um, and she also stated that she opened Carly's door to check on her and said that Carly was fine at this point. 5.45 a.m. doesn't mention Carly laying there wide awake. After this point, she went back to sleep, woke up later on again, 7.15 to 7.30, and Carly was gone when she went to check on her. Obviously, this tells a completely different story. One of the main things, the first thing that sticks out is that Melissa had said that she slept in Carly's room. When she began to give out details of this, that is the story that she went by. But in this interview with Dateline, again, that occurred right after the disappearance, I believe before any serious details came out, it made it seem like she didn't stay in Carly's room that night and stayed in her own because she walked up to Carly's shut door and opened it. Which brings us to another point. In the first live stream where there were details given on the night, Melissa stated that she wouldn't have woken up if Carly woke up and kind of left the room because Carly's door had been wide open, so she wouldn't have heard anything. But again, in this interview with Dateline, she is making it seem like Carly's door was shut every single time she went to check on her. Dr. Phil asked Melissa, about this, she said, quote, yeah, that was a false story because I wasn't, it was a lie about checking in on Carly because it was the beginning. I didn't know what to say and I shouldn't have even done the interview. Zach goes in to add, quote, it was too early. You don't know what to do. There's no handbook for this man. A lot of people have really been hanging on to this saying that um, it was knowingly done. They purposely had fabricated the story and then switched the story back again. Um, and others believe that it was just a grieving stepmother trying to do what police said and not give out information. So she said something random. And to be fair, I feel like we really don't know why. And at the very least, it seems to have been cleared up in other interviews. On top of that, Melissa had stated that she last spoke to Carly at 5.45 a.m. and noticed Carly was missing at 6.30 a.m. Um, and she also stated that they called police and and Lindsay as well around 930 to say that Carly was missing. Um, but if you look at the timeline of them searching for two hours for Carly, like they said, and calling at 930, that brings the timeline to what is accepted by police now, which is 730 AM. 
So a lot of people also were saying, why did you lie and say it was 6.30 that you last saw her? Honestly, I just feel like there was so much going on. It's very likely that these times were just jumbled and that this was just a very stressful event. Um, but a lot of people believe there is a little bit more to it than that. So now back to the searches. Because of the location of the neighborhood, as you can see, there are no gas stations nearby. There's not any stores nearby. There's no surveillance that would have captured where Carly was heading. It was the desert on the side of the highway early on a Saturday morning. As I had told you before, Mono County Sheriff's Department did do a search and this continued for about a week. They brought out all the resources they possibly could. The FBI was involved, other agencies were involved. Unfortunately, they kept coming up empty handed. They never found anything from my understanding that gave them any answers as to where Carly could have possibly gone. Melissa and Zach had stated that they did find the single footprint outside of their home that they believed was Carly's, which is why they initially thought that Carly had just gone out to clear her head if she had had a night like, you know, they said she had and maybe she woke up early and had come to and was like, what on earth happened? Maybe she did go out to get a breather of fresh air. Um, but obviously when they couldn't find her in two hours, they reported her missing. Uh, and, it's, and it also seemed like pretty early on, they believed that it was possible Carly was abducted. In that first live stream, 10 hours after Carly was reported missing, that's what Melissa states, that they were close to a highway. And so she was worried Carly had been taken if she had headed off on foot, because that's really the only place she could have gone other than out into the middle of the desert. There was something that was uncovered that was incredibly helpful for the police. Three different witnesses called into police to report that they had seen Carly in the early morning hours of October the 13th. Two of the individuals that saw Carly that morning actually knew her. Now, nothing very personal. They didn't know her very well. From my understanding, they had just seen her in the neighborhood. Um, and one of them was retired law enforcement and the other was a teacher at a nearby school, but it wasn't the one that Carly went to. Richard Eddy was one of those neighbors that came forward saying that he had seen Carly that morning. When she was uh, missing, I don't quite understand the whole thing. I was in my hot tub room. Uh, it was probably about 6.30, 7 o'clock. I'm kind of, this happened a couple years ago, so I'm just trying to guess at it. But I'd say between 6.30 and 7. And uh, it was kind of chilly that morning, I remember. And for some reason, I looked out towards the street. I have big, big windows in the hot tub room. So I looked out towards the street and I thought, that's unusual. There's a young girl walking by. She had long, kind of long brown hair. Uh, she, she had clothes on. She had a white, I think, I can't even remember, but I think she had a white top and maybe gray bottoms or something. But she had clothes on, but it was kind of chilly. And I thought, that's kind of, kind of weird that she would be there. And she was waving a, a piece of paper, like a, a 12 by 12 piece of paper. She was just waving it in the air and, and walked by. Now, later that morning, I think it was about eight o'clock, maybe I'm guessing probably, that her mother says, have you seen my daughter? And I told her the story that I had just seen a girl walk by, but I didn't know it was her. Oh, that was her. I think you were the last one to see her. I said, well, I don't know, but I'll help you go look. So at that time I had a side-by-side a, a -side motorcycle. So I rode up into the canyon, which is straight over from my house, because I figured maybe that's where she would go, because I have two chairs set up in that little canyon, and there's a little fire pit there, and I shoot my guns down into the canyon. And I went over there, and she wasn't there, and by the time I came back, she was at my driveway and I told her I didn't see anything and she says, well, well, thank you very much. And that's about the last I really heard of the whole thing. Second neighbor described the exact same thing, just seeing this young girl, same description, same outfit with the same piece of paper and the same behavior. And the third witness, who was someone that did not know Carly personally, described a young girl wearing the white t-shirt and gray sweatpants at the intersection of Highway 6 and right where her neighborhood was. Like, And this man said that he was traveling along Highway 6 when he noticed a girl around 7.30 a.m. awkwardly standing at the highway behind this barbed wire fence, just like 
staring off into space. So it appears from these witnesses that Carly had gone off that morning sometime between 6.30 and 7.30 a.m. This was about a mile from the home and it usually takes the average person about 30 minutes to walk a mile. So this timeline does make sense. Um, and she was clearly heading towards Highway 6, but after this, no one has any idea where she went. But this also brought up the question that if she was seen just a mile from her home along Highway 6 at 7.30, around the time that Melissa and Zach noticed she was missing before going to search for her, how on earth was she missed? If she was on foot, she couldn't have got very far. How on earth was she missed? Where did she go? I was like, how could I have missed her, you know? She was just right there. Just something's wrong. Somebody took her. There's just something. And I wanted to put it out there. And I want you guys all to know. And so if you needed to know all that, great. And if you didn't care, great. Because I don't care. I just want her. We want her home. And thank you for the continued support. And uh, let's bring Carly home. And thank you all again. If she had been walking on Highway 6, it's I feel like they would have found her. I have, again, looked at any possible route she could have gone following roads, and I will say that this looks to be cattle land. I'm only making that assumption because I have seen cattle guards on a lot of the actual used roads, um, and there appears to be barbed wire fencing up and different cattle roads throughout the desert. So I don't know if they were able to use any of those dirt roads that are probably cattle roads to go back into the desert and see if they could find her or if they mainly were just relying on going down Highway 6 and checking in Bishop and Chalfont unless she by chance got into the car with someone while on the highway. And that is something that a lot of people believe has happened, that she was picked up on Highway 6, which is apparently very well known for being traveled by truckers at very early morning hours. However, I have this issue with that theory because everything that we know about her state of mind, I feel like if you're scared of your own parents, you've been saying that you're scared a car is going to kill you. The level of paranoia and fear that she was feeling while it very well could have been gone by around 7.30 a.m. the next morning, because she went missing, something tells me that there was still something not quite right. I don't feel like she would have gotten in the car with a complete stranger. She also didn't have her phone. Uh, she had no way to really reach out to a friend or anyone to come and get her. No one has said that they picked her up. On top of that, police have searched her phone. They feel like had someone picked her up and dropped her off somewhere, they likely would have reported that, seeing her face all over the news. It's also possible that she didn't willingly get into a vehicle with anyone on Highway 6. Uh, maybe someone took advantage of her in her vulnerable state and got her out of the area fast enough to where the immediate searches that were done. But another issue that I have with her being taken like that is that the entire side of the road is just dirt, dry dirt that's very easily disturbed. And since police searched this entire area, dogs were brought in. I feel like if someone had pulled over and tried to pull her into the vehicle, there would have been signs somewhere along that road of... Um, you know, a struggle, dirt flying everywhere, someone being dragged into a car, dogs would have alerted or something. But from what I know, they have not found anything. A long search by authorities was called off on October 25th, 2018, and the family continued searching. But unfortunately, as I'm sure you can guess, based on a lot of the information that I gave you prior, there was a lot of tension in the family and there still is a lot of tension. I don't believe that Zach and Melissa have any communication with Lindsay. Lindsay has made it very clear that she has a lot of questions about things that just don't add up to her with Zach and Melissa. So Lindsay has stated that she felt something has been off from the get-go. When Zach first called her, the first thing he said was Carly is gone. And she thought that that was an odd choice of words because in her mind, the first thing she thought of when she heard gone was Carly is dead. So she just thought that the way he told her was strange. On top of that, she said that Melissa has changed her story, which we already briefly dabbled in. But from what I've gathered in interviews and things like that with Lindsay, there seems to be more issues that they've had with changing stories. I think it's more so like in personal communications maybe. Um, but so that's made her feel very uneasy. And Zach also seemed to stay mainly quiet about what happened. She's also questioned why Melissa said that Carly left in jeans, skinny jeans, 
and a white t-shirt. And then as soon as the information came out from the witnesses, she changed to, okay, well, Carly was in these gray sweatpants. Melissa has come forward separately and kind of given her explanations of all of this. First and foremost, she said that she was essentially just stressed when it comes to all of the changing information. She already had addressed the dateline interview and then I guess like the time changes and things like that. She also said, look, like this was just a stressful situation and I was panicking. She also said that she had just originally guessed that Carly left in skinny jeans because Carly had a lot of clothes and there was absolutely no way for her to know for sure what Carly had left in. But what Carly wore like 98% of the time was a pair of skinny jeans and she had been wearing a light blue pair of skinny jeans the night before when she was hanging out with friends. So she just assumed that Carly put on a pair of skinny jeans like she normally would and left the house. She said the last that she saw Carly wearing was a white t-shirt. It was kind of like off white uh, with a big kind of logo on the back, like a band tee. And then there was something over the left heart, like a small little logo as well. And Carly was also just wearing underwear. So again, the pants she put on was pretty much anyone's guess. She did say, however, that they looked in the laundry and were able to see that Carly had not taken that white shirt off. So um, they figured that was what she continued wearing out, which does match what the witnesses had to say. So another thing that I really wanted to address is a huge thing that is focused on everywhere that you go to look into this case. And that is that Melissa had actually filmed Carly that night. So there are two videos that have yet to be released to the public. I believe the FBI has them, the local police have them. Um, Melissa obviously took them, so she has them. I believe that Lindsay at least has one of the two videos. Also been listened to by just a handful of people. Dr. Phil listened to a recording. Um, I think there were a few journalists that listened to the recording as well. Um, so it's nothing super publicly known. And essentially we just have what everyone says is in the recording to gather information from. So the fact that this recording was taken to begin with was actually praised by the police. They said that it helped them have a lot of insight into Carly's state of mind, her behavior prior to her disappearance. They were able to form conclusions from it, understand what she might be thinking, what that might mean her next moves would have been, where she may have gone. While a lot of people have questioned why on earth you would film her in such a state of distress instead of just going to get her help. So again, we kind of have the situation where something was done and we've got both sides of the spectrum here people that think it's great and people that think it's the worst thing that anyone could have ever done. Now, according to Melissa, it's not even an actual video recording. She did turn on her video, but then she put her phone in her pocket so you can only hear things. It's just an audio clip. She claimed that the only reason she did this to begin with was to show Carly the following day. She assumed Carly would wake up the next morning. All of this would be over. The paranoia would be gone. The drugs would have worn off um, and she'd be able to show it to her and be like, this is what you actually like on drugs, like this is what it does to you. You were so scared. You thought I was gonna kill you. You were having irrational thoughts, delusions, paranoia, hoping that that would maybe encourage Carly to think twice the next time that she thought about using drugs. So Melissa said that she wanted this to be a life lesson. Claims during the Dr. Phil show, which you can watch right here on YouTube and see for yourself, Lindsay states that this recording, the one part of the recording that she heard that Carly directly asks Melissa to call 911 and Melissa outright refuses. Um, and Melissa has responded to this saying that she never refused to call 911 and Carly never directly asked her to, or she would have. Now this is circulated everywhere in podcasts, YouTube videos, you name it. I mean, there's even direct quotations that you can find out there, which doesn't make sense to me because no one has heard it. So I don't know um, if there's actually any direct quotes out there. Um, but either way, I guess during this Dr. Phil show, he wanted to figure out if this was the truth or not. So he listened to the audio and afterwards he said that Carly in fact hadn't ever directly asked Melissa to call 911, which is something that is so very widely reported. He says after he listens to it that Carly asked Melissa if she would call 911 if anything happened to her. And I guess Melissa agrees and then goes on to reassure her that nothing was going to happen to her. She was going to be okay. And then I guess Carly comes back and was like, but if anything were to happen, would you? And Melissa says like, yes, or something along those lines. We have some people claiming there's just this outright 
refusal to call 911 for help, which obviously is not something that's acceptable. And then we have all of these other people saying that they've heard it and there is never any direct request to call 911. And because I haven't heard it and it's not been released, there's really no way to confirm any of that. So it's really just been out there for whoever to say whatever about it, uh, make their decision on what they believe was said in it without anyone actually fully knowing what has been said in it. Um, and since we have two people saying different things and both said that they listened to it, it's really just kind of frustrating. Melissa and Zach also caught a lot of flack in the Dr. Phil show because they, I guess, had been asked for the audio prior to the show and refused to give it. And then when he confronted them about it on the show, they acted like they had never been asked. Um, and there was kind of this back and forth before Melissa decided that Dr. Phil could listen to it, but she didn't want to air it like on the actual show. Um, and I will say this as a parent, I probably would not want to air something like that of my child. I feel like already with just the story that's been told, we already have a good idea of the mentality that Carly was in at the time. And I mean, imagine being filmed and you don't know it and you're in the, in the middle of some sort of mental crisis or possibly drug reaction. Um, I don't know. I feel like as a parent, I wouldn't really want to put that out there for everyone to hear because unfortunately people would take that as an opportunity to pick Carly apart if it were out there. So I don't know if that's why they decided to not release it fully, um, but it just wasn't released. But I feel like at this point, the FBI has the audio, the police has the audio. So they're the ones who can actually do something with it. Police also during their investigation decided to check with Carly's friends and family. They all were interviewed. Um, granted, we know nothing about these interviews because police have not released anything. I've even seen it's possible that there were lie detector tests that were taken. Um, but from what I've seen, a handful of Carly's friends did give police some sort of information uh, to give them more insight on Carly's behavior. Now, Donald specifically was able to tell police information about that night. Now, I've also seen that he's posted quite a handful of things on social media, but what Donald has claimed is that they were hanging out with a few friends that night. He's been very adamant that they never went to a party. As I stated before, it just seemed like a small gathering of friends and that at some point during that night, Carly began to panic. And I think he even stated that they first started smoking weed at around 7 p.m. that night. Um, but out of nowhere, flip of the switch with Carly. All of a sudden, Carly was scared of him, which again seems to be a very recurring theme of she's scared of the person that's close to her. Um, she was scared of the music that was playing. And at some point they decided to leave wherever they were, which my assumption was they were at the RV park and head to Donald's home, probably because she was wigging everybody out. Um, and he wanted to get her to a place where she wasn't around a lot of people. Now, during this walk, according to Donald, she continued to panic. She was very, very paranoid. And at one point he had to kind of grab her and hold her to try to calm her down. And I've seen that she potentially bit him before taking off away from him. Donald said that he didn't chase after her because it was very clear to him that she was horrified of him, again, being very scared of someone close to her. And he was worried that if he took off running after her or tried to grab her again, that it was just going to make things worse, that he was just contributing to this fear and paranoia. Um, and I'm sure at this point, he probably knew that Melissa was coming to get her. Um, I can't say that for a fact. So Donald just let her kind of run off and didn't go after her, which again, he has gotten a lot of flack for. Their friends have allegedly claimed that they saw a bit of change in behavior over Carly in that time leading up to her disappearance. I guess some friends said that Carly was having paranoid episodes is how they were being described. She would all of a sudden become very paranoid and she seemed to be fixated on her phone saying that her phone was being tracked, but I don't believe anyone was able to offer up any more information. Like who did she think was tracking her phone? Why did she think that someone was tracking her? Um, and on top of that, despite the friends making these claims, Carly's family, including Zach, Melissa, and Lindsay said that they had never witnessed any of these paranoid episodes before. She had never mentioned being, you know, scared someone was tracking her on her phone. So again, we just have like a small bit of information, but there still seems to be so much in the air. While it does seem possible that Carly's weed was possibly laced with some sort of drug, this information from the friends obviously makes me kind of wonder and the length in which she seemed to be displaying these paranoid behaviors. Uh, well, first of all, it's not been reported to my knowledge that anyone else 
that smoked that night had any sort of strange reaction to it. If it is true that Carly had been experiencing some sort of paranoid episodes leading up to this, it makes me wonder if smoking marijuana uncovered a mental illness of some kind. Now, I know I'm gonna get probably a lot of flack for this from a handful of people, but it has been proven in a handful of studies that it is possible smoking marijuana can make you more likely to develop temporary psychosis, which essentially fits everything in Carly's behavior that night. Um, it also can trigger long-term mental disorders like schizophrenia, which again could explain Carly's behavior that night. I don't know if the police ever were able to get any evidence to prove one way or the other. I don't know if they were able to figure out if it was laced, if they were able to go and question the friends that she was with. I just feel like having that bit of information is just important to know in general for situations like this where it could be assumed that the marijuana was laced and that could explain someone's behavior um, or it's just a bad reaction. But but there can be something more serious going on. First of all, you don't know what it's laced with anymore, especially not these days, and you couldn't need immediate medical attention. Or if there is some mental you know, disorder that's being brought up from using marijuana, that also needs some help right away, some assistance. So I just think that's important to note. And that is something that Melissa and Zach have stated that they regret, that they wish they had taken her somewhere to do something, but hindsight is 2020, and unfortunately when this was happening, they didn't. And while it seems that this chaos kind of continues and is still going on to this day with a lot of finger pointing, blaming, there's apparently doxing that has gone on in this case. We've got people making horrendous threats to other people. There's just a lot of nasty behavior in this case. Carly is still missing to this day. She's still missing and she still should be the focus of this investigation. Where is Carly? Has anyone seen her? Get her picture out there, get information out there. That is the priority because clearly something was going on with Carly. We could sit here and argue to the end of time about what exactly it was. And those answers may come with time, but it takes figuring out where she is to probably get to those answers. She snatched off of the side of Highway 6. Did she wander into the desert? Not sure where she was going out of having these hallucinations. Um, did she maybe wander into an area where the searches somehow didn't find her? Maybe she realized she was lost and got scared and crawled under one of these bushes. However, infrared was used. So I just, I don't know what could have possibly happened to her or where she could have possibly gone. As I said, the FBI was brought in to assist in searches in the investigation and to try to help locate her, but I have not seen anything else specific stated that they have done, or if they are still helping out with the case, there is a page up for her on the FBI website and they do have their own reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Carly Gousset. Um, but I do know that there was a press conference in 2019. I unfortunately have not seen much since then. Mono Sheriff's Police Department stated that they were essentially no closer to answers. They had nothing leading them in any sort of direction, which is something very devastating to hear. And the FBI essentially came up and said, hey, we want the public to call in tips because we need tips to go any further. So everything is just at this massive standstill and there's been even more chaos because the families have had their own PIs. There have been other people that have come in to look at things on their own. And because it's been so publicized, I feel like a lot of people have taken this as an opportunity at their like one shot of fame and like getting out there and oh, I'll find her. My method will work the best. And with that said, there were quite a handful of things that happened on social media in 2018, which was kind of like the first incident that happened shortly after Carly's disappearance, a YouTube channel called Kate Yup was started and it's an ASMR eating channel where the girl doing it was basically just showing from like her nose down and it appeared she was blindfolded. Somehow a lot of people began to comment speculating on if this was Carly. This reminds me of the Marina Joyce situation where people start commenting things all across the board, like blink twice if you need help. Two minutes, like flick your hair back, like all these different things to try to encourage someone to show some sign that there's something going on. And I know that people mean well, but if you genuinely have speculations that there is something going on, take that information to the police and let them try to figure out what's going on. As if not, it's probably going to trickle into a giant 
uproar where a lot of people ultimately end up being hurt um, and someone can unfortunately take advantage of the situation, which is exactly what seemed to be happening here. A lot of people were doing just that, telling this girl to do different things to indicate that she was in fact Carly Gousset and was being held hostage by someone. And this girl, I guess, started playing along with it for a while. And it's to the point where I just want to like make you guys aware there are still people recently, if you go and look at any of the Carly Facebook pages, there are people recently that are like, hey, there's a girl on YouTube that I think is her. And like this girl, this Kate Yup person has long been proven to not be Carly. There was another instance in 2019. The video was released on July 19th, 2019. It has been watched over 22 million times. Um, and this person was out dirt biking in this area in California when they saw someone they believed to look very similar to Carly Gousset. They say on there that they called 911, they did report it, but despite doing that, they still went to the lengths of making it seem like they had found her, um, which again, imagine how damaging that can be to the family. Um, there's like this, there's a picture of her on the thumbnail. I mean, it literally circles a girl and points to her and really suggests that, hey, I found this girl. And if I'm being quite frank, the whole YouTube channel is kind of slimy on top of that. They clearly learned absolutely nothing from the situation and people calling them out because their titles after this include children, first of all, and it's like found missing baby in a stolen Tesla, saved missing kid from abandoned mine, save six year old in a trunk of a stolen car. And granted, I don't know much about this channel. They have a big following of over 1 million followers, um, but I just don't personally think it was that great. And I think that video where they claimed this person to be Carly, they should have taken it down. Clearly that was used for clicks because it was going viral at the time. Unfortunately, it is still up there, which really honestly kind of sucks. Um, and then on top of that, as recently as 2021, the same sort of thing happened again. There was a young woman on TikTok that a lot of people believe to look just like Carly Gousset. And the same thing happened as with the Kate Yup, essentially, where people were like asking this young woman to do certain things to indicate if she was in trouble or not, or you know, if she was Carly Gousset. And I don't know if this young woman actually did try to do them again to keep that attention and keep people coming back to the videos. Um, but these viewers very clearly believed that she did because they continuously reported it. The police did look into it. And from my understanding, this girl was also proven to not be um, Carly Gousset. But it's just, I hate seeing that. It's social media. You're never going to avoid any of these negative things happening and people doing whatever, no matter how shady and low and harmful it is to get views on their videos claiming they're a missing person for the heck of it for views. I'm honestly sure that this is not going to be the last time something like that is going to happen. Um, and it sucks because there is also this fine line where you want people to be on the lookout. This is exactly what you want. It's for people to recognize Carly. And so I keep trying to focus on that positive side of things that this is people that remember Carly's story. They remember what she looks like to up to 2021. Like people are still thinking about her and remembering her there's also absolutely no lack of theories in this case either. Again, kind of showing that tension between the family. Lindsay has speculated that Melissa and Zach have a lot more information than they are letting on. And Lindsay has even openly suggested the possibility that Carly died in the middle of the night from an overdose. That specifically when Melissa woke up at 545 and rolled over to see Carly wide awake with her eyes wide open, that Carly was dead. Which obviously goes on to insinuate a lot of other things that are criminal. Uh, and she's also stated that she believes that Melissa was actually who all of these witnesses saw that morning in the gray sweatpants and the white t-shirt. And it wasn't in fact, actually Carly. I don't know much about the half-life of drugs, but considering this could have been laced with pretty much anything, I feel like if the weed had been laced, she smoked it at seven, I just feel like an overdose would have happened fairly quickly. I don't know how common it is to overdose like eight to 12 plus hours after taking a drug, um, knowingly or unknowingly. So I don't know how plausible that theory could be. Um, and again, 
Lindsay has come forward to say that she just wants answers to these questions. It's all just speculation. Um, and Melissa and Zach just aren't giving her the answers to her questions. Melissa and Zach, on the other hand, have said that they think it's very possible that Carly was abducted after leaving their home early that morning, which again was what Melissa was stating within 10 hours of Carly's disappearance. Zach has also stated that he believes that it's possible that she walked so far into the desert being disoriented that she just got lost and succumbed to the elements maybe, or maybe she eventually found her way out and is off somewhere completely fine. Now to me, based on eyewitnesses and Carly's behavior, I think that at that time in the morning, there was something still going on, which again is what leads me to believe this was not a drug laced with anything that she was experiencing some underlying mental disorder she may have had. Um, Again, just speculation. If she was outside that morning looking up at the sky with this piece of paper in her hand, the first thing that I know comes to my mind is a map. Like, did she think she had a map to go somewhere? Um, which is why I think it's so important that the police have that audio recording because was there anything she said that night that you know you could put together, even if it sounds absolutely wild, that could have been something of importance to her, someplace that she wanted to go. There really is just no telling what kind of delusions she could have been having at the time or hallucinations. So to me, I think it's very likely that she wandered off into the desert. I've already spoken about my thought process behind her maybe getting into the car with a stranger, willingly or unwillingly. At this point, everything is on the table because nobody seems any closer to finding the answers. That's even like the last thing that police have said. So I am hoping that continuing to raise awareness about Carly's disappearance will push authorities to continue digging into it. Um, years have passed at this point. Is there any new technology that could be used to possibly help search for her in that desert area? Are there any different organizations that maybe could be reached out to to come out that specialize in searching in the desert? Um, kind of like how Adventures with Purpose specializes in underwater dives and searching for people there. I just feel like after this many years, some new things should possibly be looked into and they could totally be doing that and I just don't know. Um, but I just feel like there's gotta be something more done because so many people knew about this that I feel like if there were more tips that were gonna come in, they would have already come in at this point. However, this brings me to the next point, which I really want to reiterate is that there is a way to submit tips anonymously. I feel like with everything going on on social media and the doxing that's being done, the threats that are being made, it's very possible someone's just absolutely too scared to say anything. Now, there is a pretty hefty reward speaking along those lines. FBI is offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Carly Gousset. On the official Bring Carly Home website, which I'm pretty sure is run by the Gousses, um, it says that they are offering a $17,500 reward. So there is a lot of money out there for whoever has information and can lead authorities to Carly. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know a lot of detailed information about the time leading up to her disappearance, about these recordings, about a lot. We don't know what their life was like prior to this. We don't know so much. Top priority is bringing Carly home and figuring out what happened in a way that doesn't potentially harm someone else. So I will have everything you could possibly need down below if you have any information in Carly's case that you can get to authorities so that they can be one step closer. Um, I don't think I don't think there has been an approved GoFundMe. I think in the mess of everything there were even multiple GoFundMes created by people not even connected to the family. So just be very careful in this case in terms of donating or um, anything along those lines because it just seems like everyone has taken this as an opportunity to know that Lindsay has stated on a more recent interview that was done a couple weeks ago. Uh, the best way to figure out where you can donate to help increase the reward would be to reach out to the FBI. So if you feel so inclined, that's definitely something that you can do. Other than that, share Carly's story, share her missing person person's poster. Um, and if you see her call 911, if you see someone that looks like her, that you think could possibly be her call 911 and try to not take those matters into your own hands. That being said, that's all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Carly's story. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.